So welcome to this uh, new edition of the, uh, of the Brain Talks, uh, which is a podcast series under the Brain Innovation Days umbrella. Um, we have developed as a team Disrupt and, re and Rewire, how brain innovation is changing Europe. Uh, the Brain Innovation Days aim actually to bring together key opinion leaders and stakeholders um, from the brain innovation ecosystem in order to create synergies and showcase the importance of brain innovation and how it is changing Europe and changing the world. In our Brain Talk Overtime session, we now look back uh, at the launch event that we had in October 2020, where we hosted a panel discussion on enabling brain innovation with key stakeholders from vital European institutions. As you may remember, the panel was jam-packed with exciting discussion amongst colleagues from the European Commission, the Innovative Medicines Initiative, as well as the European Medicines Agency. And the interesting conversation could have lasted for the full event. Uh, in this regard, we're happy to welcome back today one of our panelists, uh, Florence Butlin, from the Office of Therapies for Neurological and Psychiatric Disorders at the European Medicines Agency. Joining Florence and myself today, we also have Professor Patrice Boyer, um, who is the Vice President of the European Brain Council and a clinical psychiatrist. And we also have with us Professor Fabio Blandini, Professor of Neuropsychopharmacology, uh, Scientific Director at the Mondino Foundation in Pavia, but also the Chair of the Pan-European Committee of the International Brain Research Organization. I will be your moderator today. I'm the Executive Director of the European Brain Council, a founding partner of the Brain Innovation Days, and really eager uh, for the discussion today. Uh, Florence, I'm turning to you uh, first, and uh, actually I would like to uh, invite you to present what the European Medicines Agency does and how you're contributing to this general topic of uh, brain innovation. Thank you very much uh, for this nice introduction and for the invitation. So yes, I'm, I'm myself uh, uh, working at the EMA uh, in the Office for Neurological and Psychiatric uh, Disorders. As you mentioned, I'm a clinical psychiatrist by background. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here today. So. As you know, the EMA um, has a responsibility to uh, evaluate and supervise the medicines uh, for human and animal health as well uh, in Europe. So our EMA operates uh, through a European network of experts and scientific committees, which basically are independent and would provide a scientific opinion to the European Commission. So it's the European Commission will issue a decision on whether or not a new medicine will be authorized. And in the post-authorization phase, there is also a number of activities in which EMA operates and contributes, whether it is a safety concern that may require a change in the labeling that the physician and the patient may need to be aware of, or any uh, harmonization of indication for a specific treatment uh, throughout Europe. So all of this really is to ensure that um, the medicines are safe and effective throughout you know, the, the life cycle of, of the product. So from development to uh, authorization and afterwards. So when it comes, it comes to development, um, it's uh, also the role of the EMA to foster innovation. So innovation, it's uh, about uh, really having the opportunity to discuss early with our stakeholders. So it can be uh, researchers, uh, developers from industry, academics, uh, if they have a project, if they have uh, the intention to develop the product uh, in an in indication and they need to get advice on different aspects. It can be quality, efficacy, safety of a product. Uh, they can come back uh, many times as, as much as they need um, through our scientific advice platform. Uh, they can also discuss uh, the development plan uh, if the condition targets uh, children and adolescents in particular. So that's uh, through the regulation uh, for pediatrics uh, uh, that uh, came into force in 2007. We have uh, uh, this uh, also uh, responsibility to to try and uh, really have uh, medicines for children who are evidence-based uh, 
um, and that's something that companies can come and, and, and discuss uh, uh, with us. Uh, we have an um, innovation task force to discuss very innovative uh, products. And uh, as you know, the digital tools um, are uh, very much um, under a quick development and, and we need to know what's going on. We need to have an early dialogue uh, so we can really guide the companies uh, through um, our own uh, requirements and try to uh, promote the, the studies uh, as early as possible, in a, so, so we have a successful outcome. That's um, that's few of the uh, the tools we have. Uh, we have also in place um, uh, an office who, uh, which is very dedicated to the support for SME, to the small and medium enterprise, and we have not only administrative support, scientific support, but also uh, financial incentives that that uh, obviously uh, can help uh, companies uh, to. Uh, uh, to develop uh, products um, uh, from the more uh, financial uh, viewpoint. And um, what is it, was it important really uh, also to, to say is that uh, we are involved in a number of projects that are uh, EU funded uh, or with uh, academic uh, uh, colleagues. Um, and it um, can be through uh, initiative, uh, innovative medicine initiative, as you said. Uh, IMI, uh, but uh, also can be a project funded by the uh, European Commission. So uh, obviously we want to really have uh, innovative uh, products for um, also medicines, uh, treatment uh, conditions that are of very high uh, unmet medical need. And uh, we have a, um, a framework for that, which is PRIME, which tries really to um, allow close and regular interaction with um, companies and developers when we think that a product is particularly uh, promising, that it can bring uh, something innovative and also uh, something that uh, we provide will, will fill a gap uh, in, in a certain condition. So um, it's um, overall uh, yeah, different type of uh, platform and possibility to interact with. Uh, those, then we have also regulatory tools. Regulatory tools are, um, for example, accelerated assessment or um, authorization under certain circumstances, exceptional circumstances, uh, conditional approval. So this is, um, in a way, a possibility, you know, to allow the medicine to reach the market um, when we feel that the benefit risk is positive. So we have more positive. Uh, um, uh, efficacies and um, you know concern on the safety, but still we need to uh, have more data. So it can be on a specific population, or can be on the long term or on safety aspects. Uh, so we have those tools not to block the product from entering the market, but still the company will have to provide us with more data. So that's what you observe for the for the COVID drugs, for example. So uh, what I want to say also about safety is that we are monitoring closely the safety of the product once uh, it's on the market in Europe. So it, it's not, uh, not only that we authorize, but um, we are in very uh, close um, collaboration with our stakeholders. Uh, so it can be also uh, healthcare professionals, the patients, uh, they may uh, tell us about the product. So I'm thinking, for example, of... Uh, uh, the different uh, scientific and regulatory review uh, we carry um, out for um, antidepressant in children and adolescents. Uh, because as you know, there were in the past different signals that um, uh, for this population, uh, the risk of suicidal behavior, of hostility, aggressive behavior uh, was more pronounced than in the adult population. And that's something that we uh, consider very thoroughly on numerous occasions. And, uh, including one recently uh, again. So um, we are really listening um, from the, um, the field, the people uh, who are knowledgeable, like uh, uh, academics, um, learning societies, and we are also monitoring uh, the scientific literature. And we know that um, in combination with what we know from the post-authorization marketing safety data that we are collecting. So it's really important to have this comprehensive overview of the situation. So when we discuss, when we evaluate thoroughly the data, we can take the, the necessary uh, um, 
regulatory action if needed and as needed. So this is um, for this question. I think, uh, yeah, overall, that's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you, thank you, Florence. Uh, I'm now turning to to uh, you, Fabio, and, uh, and Patrice, because um, you have worked on behalf of EBC on uh, uh, a document or, or a proposed revision of, of certain guidelines on uh, Parkinson's disease on one side and schizophrenia on the other. Uh, Fabio, maybe you you could tell us a little bit more on on why you saw a need uh, to to propose such a, a rewriting. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm really happy to be here because it's, I think it's a very good opportunity uh, that we are having uh, this morning, thanks to, to EBC, to, to, uh, to interact with uh, Dr. Batlain from uh, EMA. And um, uh, I will try to summarize, and then uh, uh, Patrice, of, of course, uh, can, can integrate the story. Uh, the genesis of this initiative that EBC took, uh, um, dates back to all, a little bit more than three years ago. I, I just um, joined the DBC, and uh, there was uh, uh, this, uh, this white paper uh, ongoing, uh, the, the value of treatment, as far as I remember, which was supposed to, to, uh, to highlight the gaps, uh, the existing gaps in the management of a number of neurological and psychiatric uh, disorders. And um, so uh, our attention was, was drew mainly to these two conditions, Parkinson's disease and, and, and schizophrenia, uh, for a number of reasons. I'll, I'll go a little bit into details, not, not so much uh, for Parkinson's disease, but um, basically uh, it, it was quite, quite um, in, uh, clear to, to all of us that at least for Parkinson's disease, um, clinicians and neurological uh, uh, doctors uh, have been stuck for 60 years uh, to the same old uh, uh, treatment, which is uh, uh, levodopa, so the direct precursor of, of, of dopamine, uh, waiting uh, uh, along with the, the, the whole scientific community, community for, for something new to, to, to happen, uh, especially in terms of uh, disease-modifying uh, uh, treatments, so drugs able to slow down uh, or, or, or block the progression uh, of the disease. Okay, um, levodopa has a number of, of good uh, uh, I mean aspects, but also bad, but I'm not going to too much of details here. But basically, uh, we identified the need to, to, to push specifically on, on, this, on this chapter, and we identified a number of problems uh, that are affecting uh, the development of um, potentially new uh, disease-modifying drugs in the PD field, for example, the lack of uh, uh, reliable experimental models, the fact that we do not know all the things that we should know about the pathogenesis of the disease, uh, the fact that we do not have uh, uh, actually uh, reliable biomarkers that could tell us how the disease is progressing, uh, in a, an objective uh, way, but also the uh, recognition uh, which has been uh, I mean, uh, becoming more and more evident in, in the past few years that uh, uh, Parkinsonian patients are extremely heterogeneous. So they are different one from the other. You can identify subgroups uh, of patients according to the um, uh, disease uh, rate uh, progression, the type of uh, uh, symptoms, uh, the prevalence of some subtypes of motor versus non-motor symptoms, and so on. So some of these issues, of course, uh, must be um, addressed by the basic researchers or the clinical researchers. So it is a task which is up to the scientific community. But we thought that some other aspects, uh, for some other aspects, maybe uh, involving the regulatory bodies could be, uh, of course, in this case, European Medicine Agency could be um, um, a good idea. So we basically proposed, uh, we, we sent a letter, uh, I think that was uh, in May uh, 2018, in which uh, um, the EBC, represented by her president, uh, Professor Monica Di Luca, the vice president, uh, Professor Boyer, and myself as uh, uh, chair of uh, for EBRO PERC, 
were basically uh, asking uh, um, uh, the European Medicine Agency if it was possible to start thinking of a revision of guidelines uh, uh, for uh, uh, clinical investigation of, of medicinal products, specifically for the treatment of schizophrenia, the Parkinson's disease, because we realized that these guidelines were not so updated. So um, they were, in our opinion, of course, maybe not reflecting uh, the advancement that the scientific community uh, in the schizophrenia field and in Parkinson's disease field had uh, produced abundantly over the past, uh, uh, well, in that case, uh, we're six years now, it's nine years. So we tried to, to you know, to, to, to trick the interest of, of EMA in, uh, in, in this uh, process of, of, of uh, revision, at least uh, taking into consideration the, 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 the need to, to take their hands on, uh, on, the, on a revision of these, uh, these guidelines. So this is basically, I, I don't know whether, I tried to, to, to depict the whole picture and not uh, uh, putting too many, too many details in it. Uh, maybe Patrice uh, uh, might want to, to integrate for the schizophrenia part, which was equally, equally important as the PD uh, part in this. In this uh, um, yes, issue. thank you, Fabio. And thanks very much, uh, this is Bertrand, to join us this morning and to be able to answer our major concern. Uh, regarding uh, uh, schizophrenia, and you know perfectly well uh, the, the, the case, uh, since so many years, I would say decades, there's a kind of uh, catch-22 problems that it's, there's a good, very good agreement to assess the efficacy of a drug on psychotic symptoms and to develop uh, uh, efficacious drug to decrease uh, psychotic symptomatology, delusion, hallucinations, and, and so on and so on. Uh, but the unmet need, and you mentioned in your introductory speech, the unmet need, the major unmet need uh, uh, is regarding the clinical efficacy on negative symptoms and cognitive deficit. That's the major problem, because both negative symptoms and cognitive deficit are linked to the functional outcome. So the functional outcome is not so much linked to the decrease of psychotic symptoms, of course, uh, even if it is improving a lot uh, uh, the life of the patient, but it, it is not as crucial as improving negative symptoms and uh, cognitive deficit. Uh, so we, we know that there are ongoing discussion permanent with the EMA regarding these aspects. I participate to some group of discussion by the past, which were held uh, in collaboration with ECNP. But what is remaining, and that's a major concern, is that any <clears throat> pharma, any drug company developing an antipsychotic has the feeling that first, the efficacy on psychotic symptoms, which which is meaning positive symptoms, has to be evidence. And then the secondary uh, target will be uh, uh, the efficacy of negative symptoms, the efficacy of negative symptoms. And it, it is a catch-22, because for the time being, there are not so many evidence that a drug can be efficient on both aspects. It's even contradictory to have an uh, efficacy on, on both aspects. So it it, it means that's a complete revision of the point of view of developing drug on schizophrenia has to be initiated, a complete revision. It cannot be, a, 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 you see, a two-shot process with a first shot on psychotic symptoms and a second shot on negative symptoms, because for the time being, we have no drug uh, being able uh, to evidence both <clears throat> aspects in both aspects in terms of efficacy, but a total revision on the concept with a full blown uh, guideline uh, for recommending how to develop a drug efficacious on negative symptoms and uh, functional outcome, uh, which is a, a completely different aspect. Reason why we wrote this letter <clears throat> uh, uh, almost three years ago, because uh, of course there's many advan technical advances 
uh, on how to uh, develop a drug uh, efficient on negative symptoms. There's many advances, but it has to be more drastic uh, than that. It has to be how to develop a drug uh, in, in first intention efficacious on negative symptoms, which is a total change of the point of view. And it would be very, very uh, interesting to discuss this directly with Yimei, which, which was our purpose. So that just to put in the scene and to explain for which reason we, 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 wrote, we wrote this letter. And then, of course, there's how, how, how to uh, just initiate this dialogue with Yimei is certainly things we, we are going to discuss now. So. So thank you, thank you, Fabio. Thank you, Patrice. Uh, I'll probably uh, let Florence uh, respond. So Florence, you you heard it, and, and I mean we trust you. You are uh, fully aware of, uh, of of the challenges that lie specifically uh, with all brain conditions. Basically, I mean uh, Fabio mentioned the lack of biomarkers, the need to incorporate uh, functional outcomes, how we can reflect advancements in the in the respective fields uh, in question. So that notion of uh, integration of the negative symptoms, as, uh, as as Patrice is now mentioning, so that that story around the revision of the of the guidelines. I mean, how how does the the process function, and um, what is I mean, what is the level of engagement of the EMA with clinical societies or with organizations like the EBC, and how can we help in that process? Uh, basically, as you heard, the eagerness is is clear, clearly there. The unmet need uh, need to be to be better let's say, understood, understood and addressed. And uh, obviously on our side, there is clearly a willingness of, of partnership and engagement to, uh, uh, well, to help in, in any possible ways. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And uh, yes, that's exactly the type of dialogue we need. Um, well, we, for, for the guidelines in particular, because uh, when we establish the guidelines throughout the EU, you know, we try to harmonize the requirements uh, for the member states for company to be able to provide the uh, level of evidence that we want to see from the quality, safety and efficacy viewpoint. And we want to, when we open up the guideline for revision, uh, we need to hear from the academics, um, uh, researchers, learned societies, uh, developers, healthcare professionals, patient representatives, all of them. We need to, uh, to hear what is important, what is going on, what are the most uh, advances that have been uh, done and what remains to be uh, improved. And uh, we know, obviously, uh, from the case of schizophrenia, it's absolutely true that uh, uh, cognitive impairment is, is uh, very important in terms of outcome and, and, and functioning as well as negative symptoms. And uh, at the moment, uh, we don't have uh, enough uh, treatment alternatives for the patients. So uh, we try to open up the guideline uh, to, to help, you know, a um, few years ago. Um, and uh, it's... Um, it's it's not the same type of reasoning that we can apply for new products with new mechanism of, of action on, on a different dimensional uh, set of symptoms um, as for the traditional uh, antipsychotics, whether they are um, you know, typical or atypical. Uh, if we want to have a product which specifically targets a certain uh, domain, um, and not necessarily the psychotic uh, core symptoms, uh, we want to ensure that the trial uh, is designed in a way that an efficacy can be shown only in this, uh, only on this set of symptoms. The purpose, I think, the idea behind was mainly to avoid uh, polytherapy because polytherapy is really an issue in psychiatry, as you know, patients are already taking too much drugs and um, we don't want the fear of certain um, uh, colleagues and, 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 and experts from the network was also that um, we may end up with many, uh, many different treatments targeting many different types of symptoms and that we want to avoid. Now, having said that, if um, a company comes with uh, a very different uh, product, you know, targeting specifically a, a certain uh, type of symptoms, whether it's negative or, cogn or cognitive aspects, of the disease and is able to provide a design that will show an efficacy of that product uh, in this particular um, subpopulation, uh, uh, sub um, um, dimensional um, uh, uh, symptomatology, 
well, uh, that's something that we would be willing to consider, but we want to avoid uh, polytherapy. That's why if the product is like, you know, not necessarily acting specifically on, on those type of symptoms, but has also a, a psychotic effect, um, yes, this, this, this has to be also uh, taken into consideration by developers. So that was a bit the spirit, but uh, I mean, for, for Parkinson, I, I also um, concur with what uh, Fabio Blondini said that uh, um, re recently there has been more um, discussion and piece of evidence, in particular with regard to different subtypes of the condition, uh, maybe uh, different aspects that we have not explored yet enough in the guideline. So that could be, you know, um, be a good idea to reopen the guideline and to revisit that on, under the latest um, uh, advances that have been made. Maybe they were a bit less in the past year, so we were not that uh, keen to reopen the guideline because reopening a guideline, revisiting a guideline, it's a, kind of a long and, a, and huge process. So we have to have enough uh, scientific evidence to do that. And that's why we welcome those discussions because for us, uh, we know when it's the right time, you know, when we can really um, gain the most from this exercise. Um, and unfortunately, I must say, and uh, wait, yes, um, we have been through very challenging times uh, at EMA um, since 2016 uh, with the Brexit, the relocation of the agency, and now we have the COVID situation that obviously is high priority in terms of public health in Europe and elsewhere. So it's not, not saying that we are not uh, interested in, in innovation at all, but reopening a guideline is something very specific that requires uh, really um, time and resources that we hope to be able to resume very shortly. But uh, for the moment, yes, we, that's the, gui the guideline we have are the guidelines that are on our websites. And um, some, some of them, like schizophrenia guideline, has, has been revisited uh, a few years ago already, and, and, and Parkinson would probably deserve to be uh, also reopened. But um, when time comes, uh, we will welcome, uh, you know, as usual, interaction with all of stakeholders and uh, uh, people who have to, uh, who can provide interesting uh, input uh, that we can uptake into the guideline. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Maybe Patrice, I'll, I'll uh, let you respond to uh, to this. Maybe. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you. No, I. So there's many, 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 many aspects, in, of course, uh, regarding what was you, you just explain explain us. There are the, the first the theoretical aspect and technical, and then the practical aspects of the collaboration with with EMA. Uh, regarding the theoretical and technical uh, aspects, I understand very well your concern to avoid polytherapy. So, uh, the current status for developing an antipsychotic drug is first to evidence its activity on psychotic symptoms, then, if it can be done, uh, to evidence as well uh, that it is reducing negative symptoms and it could improve functional outcome. Uh, so any drug company uh, now is following this two-step this two-step procedure, and it's uh, uh, it, up to now it's a complete failure. It's a complete failure. Okay. So when it happens that it is a complete failure, we, we, we have to draw a conclusion from it, and the conclusion could be that uh, uh, to be active and predominantly on negative symptoms is not, of course, it can conduct to a polytherapy, but it can as well improve the natural course of the disease. Because the natural course of schizophrenia disease is underlined by the deficit, by the negative symptom, by the cognitive deficit. It is what is happening first, and it's probably the core target uh, of the disease. Even if psychotic symptoms are quite impairing and spectacular and so on. But so reason why I, I was mentioning that probably it's a drastic revision of the global vision of the natural course of schizophrenia. And it has to be 
discuss with, with, with EMA, I think. Because if we stick to this idea to develop a drug first active on psychotic symptoms, then to have a supplementary advantage, which could be the activity on negative symptoms, we will always fail to evidence it, and that's the current situation. And we have to get out from this from this situation. And of course, uh, it, uh, we, we have to, to uh, <clears throat> obtain a, consus a, a consensus in the academic field, but this consensus already exists, and it has to be exchanged with EMA. Uh, since there's clarity has to be bring in as well, because the way EMA is functioning with his uh, advisory committee on experts is not always uh, transparent for uh, the academic field outside EMA. So uh, that's another aspect. And it's, it's leading us to this very important uh, issue is how uh, the relationship with EMA and its stakeholder can be clarified and uh, uh, can be, uh, uh, I would say, implemented with not this kind of permanent concern, which is fully understandable, but which is as well paralyzing, paralyzing concerns of conflict of interest. Because uh, uh, we, we have the impression uh, when talking to the farmers that they are, first of all, they are scared. They are scared to be outside the track, first of all, and they will to stick to uh, the precise guidelines or recommendations and not be innovative at all. And I can tell you, in the field of schizophrenia, there are absolutely no innovation in drug development, no innovation, because they feel paralyzed. And this lack of innovation in drug development is certainly detrimental for patients. And I'm sure it is, it is a concern of EMA, and we have to address this concern. So that will be how to, to start a new dialogue, which could be an innovative one, you know, fundamentally innovative, more than conservative. Okay, Florence, I'll ask you to, to respond in a minute, but maybe uh, Fabio, you would like to, to add something in this and maybe uh, uh, say a word on, on you know, the potential for, for this dialogue and what a specific role for EBC there could be. Uh, and in what we could uh, we could provide uh, as as insights to the EMA. Yes. No. I'll, I'll, uh, I will go. I will go back to that. But before that, I have a, an endless list of questions. But I will select just two, just two, for Florence. Uh, one is, is a general kind of question. The other one, a, a little bit more specific to PD, and I'm really interested in, in, uh, in, in her opinion. The first one is very general. So what is it that, that, that tells the, the CNS working group that it's time to revise a guideline? What's triggering the, the, the process? So when, how, who, at a certain point, one day wakes up and says, okay, this guideline is too old. Uh, we, we need to, to, to revise it, so to start the process. This is the first one. I'm really interested in this because I don't know how the, the process w works. The other one uh, is more specific to Parkinson's disease. Um, the reason why uh, we, we, uh, we wrote that letter, at least to me, it was the conviction that uh, um, uh, revising the, 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 the guidelines could be a way to force, force, drug companies to incorporate into the, 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 the clinical trial design, you know, the, uh, uh, the new endpoints, new outcome measures suggested by the scientific com community. So, uh, for example, uh, what I was mentioning before, that the, the Parkinsonian patient's population is so heterogeneous, it is very important. I'm convinced that uh, in, in the past years, okay, there have been so many potentially uh, uh, disease-modifying drugs or neuroprotective drugs that have been tested and which failed. But I'm convinced that in most cases, only in some cases, that failures could be due to the fact that uh, the, the PD populations that have been tested, they were been tested as a whole without stratifying and identifying some groups. So maybe, perhaps, if the guidelines uh, had you know, made mandatory the certification 
So testing in, in subgroups of patients, maybe some of the, the drugs that have been tested in, in, in the past years, uh, might be working in some subgroups. But when you put together, of course, thousands and thousands of patients, regardless of the prevalence of uh, uh, certain non-motor symptoms or, um, or uh, some motor symptoms, uh, you lose everything, so the, even the potential significance, the statistical significance, you might uh, have in, in some um, subgroups. Uh, or the other thing, uh, speaking of subgroups, uh, the fact that in the past, uh, in the recent, uh, I would say, I mean, guidelines uh, for PD, uh, the last version, as far as I, as I know, dates back to 2012. So nine years in neuroscience is an eternity. In EPD, uh, many, many uh, things have been discovered, for example, in terms of uh, 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 genotyping of these patients. I'm not referring to the uh, genetic Parkinson's disease, which is a different story. Just referring to some uh, uh, common variants, for example, that are influencing the risk. And some of these, and one in particular, for example, the, 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 the glucocerebrosidase gene, uh, has come to the, to, to powerfully to the attention of the scientific community in the past three, four years. And actually, there have already been proposed some clinical trials specifically for Parkinsonian patients who express this mutation. So this is the kind of, of strategy that maybe by you know, implementing uh, new guidelines, uh, drug companies might be forced to, 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 to follow. The other, the last, uh, well, biological endpoints, for example, if, if a, a drug company is proposing some new drugs which is supposed to engage a biological target, it would be very, very important to have proof, biologically speaking, that that target has been engaged by the drug. But unless, this is my, my view, so this is what I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Batlen about. Maybe I'm wrong, but maybe if the guidelines uh, uh, explicitly uh, 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 tells the companies that they have to uh, uh, have proof that that drug is engaging that biological target, that could help, you know, in, in pinpointing uh, the 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 the, the, uh, the mechanism of the target. And last but not least, uh, the fact that maybe we should start thinking of introducing also some patient relevant outcome measures. So what do the, the patients uh, themselves feel about how the, the, the drug that they are trying uh, uh, is, is working in addition to the, all the, you know, the, 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 the scales of evaluation that the clinicians are using. So patient relevant outcome measures are becoming more and more important and none of these is mentioned in the current guidelines. So these were the two questions that I, that I wanted to, to pose. And as for the, uh, the EBC contribution, well, maybe we can go back to this right after uh, hearing from uh, Dr. Batlen. Okay. So, uh, this, please, because uh, this is another very important uh, point, I agree many, with you. Many with issues Fred. to comment on from your, from your side. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yes, M many questions. Uh, I'll try to take them one after the other, but some are probably uh, probably okay to, to combine them. So pardon me if I, uh, yeah, I combine some. So yeah, what, what I would like to say is that uh, all what you've said, I mean, uh, it's nobody can hold and we are completely uh, in agreement because obviously we need to keep up to date with the field and we try to keep up to date uh, by interacting with our stakeholders, by going to conferences, by doing some research work with uh, academic people and, uh, and also because we are regulating drugs. So as we are regulating the drugs, we see you know, regularly what is happening. So we are monitoring uh, the effects, the safety, uh, the companies are providing us with the data. So we know, for example, if um, there is a chance for a drug to um, be effective in a certain population that has not been uh, granted, you know, the full approval in the first uh, uh, in the first place. So maybe it could be interesting to to, to further, you know, uh, investigate a certain population, whether it's uh, uh, children, elderly, whether it's uh, a dimensional uh, approach, um, a sub cluster, as as you said as well. So. Um, 
Now, obviously, it, to turn that into a regulatory uh, guideline, uh, as I said, yes, it's a specific process that uh, we need to uh, open, but it doesn't prevent uh, us from, um, when companies come, try to find with them uh, the right way to guide them through this uh, innovative development. Uh, so, you know, the scientific advice platform I mentioned, um, it's also um, an opportunity for companies to discuss, for example, when they have new instruments, because I think what is very important to consider is that we need the field as well to provide us with those new instruments that would be really tailored to the new mechanism of action or to the different claims that for which we want to have products for which we need products. And that we cannot do. We don't do research ourselves at EMA. We participate into a project that are EU funded or IMI led, as I said, or we interact with academic people early if they want to, um, you know, develop a new scale or a new tool, uh, whether it's digital or not. Um, and um, we need also the field uh, to come up with those ideas because then uh, as much as we agree that we need more products, and that's for sure, I mean, there is a big issue in psychiatry and in CNS in, in general to uh, when it comes to translate, you know, uh, all the progress that has been made in the understanding of the pathophysiology of the disorder into new drugs. And it's even more true when it comes to drugs with new mechanism of action, with innovative um, a set of action on different set of symptoms. We, we need that, but we have this problem of translation. So for that, it's also because we need, I think, more, uh, we need new maybe endpoints which are validated. We need uh, uh, to reflect uh, all together on the outcome measures, um, on the way also uh, the design of the trial uh, should be. And then I, I'm coming back to the point that uh, Patrice Boyer uh, uh, touch upon on the uh, design for um, antipsychotics, uh, who, which are expected to, to target uh, uh, negative or cognitive uh, symptoms. So I think if the product comes with a very specific mechanism of action and with a very specific claim without any antipsychotic activity, uh, I mean, this specific claim, you know, could be envisaged with a design that is specific to that uh, mechanism of action. And uh, it's something else if the product uh, is not so specific and is also expected, expected to have an antipsychotic activity. And it's um, something else, again, if the product is supposed to be prescribed as an add-on, for example, to target residual uh, negative uh, or cognitive symptoms in a schizophrenic uh, patient population. So all of these methodological aspects have to be uh, also taken into consideration when we revise the guideline, if we revise the, decide to revise the guideline. Uh, so it's a combination of what is known from the scientific field, what we know as well from our network, and how we can put that into uh, regulatory requirements that are not too stringent, obviously, because we don't want to block innovation, we want to foster innovation. But at the same time, we need to be sure that the drugs that are approved are safe and effective, that the benefit risk balance is positive. So we need to be sure of what we are measuring and that the data need to be robust. To be robust, we need to have good tools because otherwise the design with, which will be poorly done and, and we will not be able to show anything at all. And that's really a missed opportunity because then we will not have the innovative treatments because we have not just given the highest chance to the drug development program to be successful. So it's really um, all, all, all of these factors within this scientific and regulatory environment that we need to, uh, to discuss. And um, I think for us, it's very important to interact with the um, Learn Society, Healthcare uh, Professional Association, and as you said, patient representatives. I think we value a lot the patient inputs. Uh, more and more patient representatives are, are, are involved in our activities and the evaluation process as well. Uh, we need to hear from the patient what is, what is important for them, because at the very end, they are the ones who are going to receive the treatment. And quite often, um, well, they know, you know, for example, what they would be able to bear as a safety adverse event. Because maybe this safety adverse event is not that important from their viewpoint. It has no so much clinical uh, impact on their daily functioning for them. And uh, it helps as well to try to have a balanced view 
of the benefit risk balance uh, when we assess the data. So um, I think uh, patient reported outcomes, this is something that we are more and more uh, um, really um, interested in. Uh, and um, it, it's it's may not necessarily reflected in the guideline, but also in in, in other platforms. Uh, as I mentioned in my uh, introdu introduction, um, the scientific advice, the innovation task task force, all the project in which we participate, uh, we try to be open as well to to this. Thank you, Florence. Uh, that's uh, that's absolutely clear. Maybe Fabio, you'd like to to say a few words um, as uh, as mentioned on uh, potential added value and specificity uh, in the contribution of, of EBC into into this process. Yes. And then uh, I'm eager to to get the the conversation moving on because uh, I think uh, we will need to, to well, bring it to a close uh, in a, in a few minutes. Yes. Well, you know, as I say, time flies when you are enjoying yourself. And so I'm really enjoying this conversation. And uh, I just realized it's almost uh, noon. Uh, uh, so, yes. Um, well, it, it is pretty, pretty obvious that EPC, EBC is more than happy to, to help uh, in, any, in any way the EMA will deem uh, uh, um, proper. Uh, and I believe uh, uh, that the EBC is in a unique position to do that because EBC is gathering, it's an umbrella organization, right? So it's gathering uh, 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 the representatives of all major um, European societies involved dealing with, with, bra with brain disorders. So uh, it's, uh, it's gathering representatives from the neurology, psychiatry, neurosurgery fields, uh, both uh, uh, in terms of preclinical and clinical research, uh, as well as uh, the uh, representative of the, the major patient organization in the same uh, thematic areas, which, which is why we are so um, aware and, and, and sensible to the issues of, of the patient's uh, organization. And we know how important it is to involve this organization more and more in the scientific process, not just because it's nice having them involved, but because they can actually help us as a researchers to, to, to do better our work, to devise, uh, uh, to, to, to design better clinical trials uh, with more adequate uh, uh, outcome measures and, and, and so on. So I believe that EBC could be uh, the perfect channel, in a way, conduit between uh, uh, EMA and the neuroscience community in the sense that it might help identify so, uh, uh, cherry picking the, 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 the best experts for the task should EMA uh, decide that these guidelines or other guidelines uh, need to be in, revised, which we think is the case. But I don't want to influence you just to say that we are here to help. We will be uh, happy to help. Uh, um, because it's, it, it is in the interest Thank you. of, Thank you, of, of Fabio. science and actually, and uh, this is, uh, first and foremost. Dri driving, uh, driving us to, towards the future. Uh, and, and in that respect, Florence, I wanted to ask you, um, th there are probably two very important developments that uh, have arisen uh, recently. Uh, one which is uh, political with the adoption of the, uh, and the launch of the EU Pharma strategy. And one which is more, uh, I would say, contextual with the uh, uh, emergence of, uh, of a really major public health uh, crisis uh, with, uh, with COVID-19. So I wanted to, to ask you um, maybe as a, as a last question, uh, how do you see this influencing uh, the, the future of EMA uh, on one side with the promise that uh, the pharma strategy bears and on the other side with maybe the lessons learned from uh, the, the COVID-19 crisis and how it is likely to, to impact uh, your work and all the dimensions that we have touched upon uh, in, in this discussion. Yes, thank you for this uh, last uh, two questions. So, um, yeah, for the, um, it, it's, uh, there is a field that is uh, quickly, quickly growing and that's a digital health um, technology. And, and it, it's something that we see uh, more and more here, uh, obviously, but it's everywhere. And uh, one thing we don't want is to for Europe to to fall behind. So that's why we are really proactively, uh, you know, um, 
um, trying to, to, to have this scientific and regulatory uh, uh, discussion and, and, and reviewing also the cases uh, we are um, confronted to. So we, more and more we see development programs involving uh, those new tools, um, either to come for scientific advice or even for evaluation. Uh, or in post authorization as variation, you know, with uh, improvement in the way we manage the patients. So obviously, there is a lot that can be expected from those tools. Um, especially, I'm thinking psychiatry. We have so many subjective measures, so uh, it can definitely help. Having said that, um, well, it's it's also very important to to see it as a global uh, global tool so we need to consider the ethical aspects uh, the pro data protection aspect it's not EMA remits but uh, that's very important I'm thinking more globally here and obviously the patient uh, everything that I think um, can help has to be really, really centered onto uh, the patients and what is clinically meaningful for the patient. So that's very important. We, we cannot um, uh, develop a tool that at the end will not provide uh, added value compared to what is already, uh, you know, here. It has to provide something. It has to be uh, really um, helpful for the patient. So that's... Um, that's what I can say for the digital. For the digital, we, we have a, a Q and we have more and more uh, because um, we have patients coming from companies, uh, how you know they can seek advice from EMA, um, what kind of advice they can get. So, uh, what we have in place is this qualification uh, tools. So basically, they can come to us and and have a discussion and try to qualify the the new digital tool. You know that can help as well for. A further development program, and they can come as much as they want. It can be an iterative process because obviously the field is uh, quickly evolving. So from the moment they um, are coming to us for the first time, and eventually the moment where they could be ready for, uh, you know, launching a big uh, development program, the tool may have already changed. So we don't want to 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 be too conservative. You know, we we know that. Uh, uh, this can evolve and we can adapt and uh, uh, we can uh, monitor and help them throughout the journey till hopefully uh, marketing authorization uh, stage. So um, for the digital health, I think this is um, a very important field and we have collaborated uh, recently with uh, ECNP. We had a session and a follow-up uh, communication on that that I provided you with because we're really felt that the stakeholders they needed to know more about uh, uh, the processes uh, and uh, the challenges, everything that can help them, uh, I think, uh, uh, was important to know. And that's why also we, we communicate uh, through a scientific journal, because it's another way as well to reach our audience and our stakeholders. And I agree with you that we need to make sure that the messages and that the, um, we want to deliver are reaching the right uh, audience. So, um, yeah, for the, um, your other question uh, was on the, um, yes, um, the release of the EU pharma strategy. So end of last year, the commission adopted a, a pharmaceutical strategy for Europe. Uh, here again, I think, um, uh, you know, really at the centers, it was about digitalization, innovation, uh, but also uh, to make sure that all of those uh, innovation and in innovative drugs or tools are reaching the patients because that's really what the COVID-19 has shown as well, that we need to make sure that uh, the innovation and availability of medicine are achieved under all circumstances. So that's, uh, I think, the, what the pharmaceutical strategy has tried to take uh, up as well as, uh, as main messages, you know. And uh, also, uh, you may be aware that uh, we have uh, adopted the EMA uh, and the heads of EU Medicines Agency joint strategy as well. It was published uh, in December last year. And the same it, uh, in the main priority areas that are outlined. It's again the availability, accessibility, the supply chain, and um, data analytics, um, digital tools. I mean, that's, that's also obviously at the heart of this uh, strategy. So 
Um, we have also the antimicrobial resistance, but that's uh, in the emerging health threats, obviously, uh, uh, highlighted by the COVID, but that's maybe not uh, so much the scope of this talk today. But also at the EMA, uh, in, um, we have our regulatory science strategy, which basically and, uh, follows uh, the same, uh, you know, um, lines uh, to take. So uh, innovation, yes, innovation to be fostered uh, in the digital. Obviously, that's a high priority on the agenda, and that's what is very lively at the moment in Europe and elsewhere. But uh, it has to be for all accessible and uh, um, we, we have to, to ensure that it reaches uh, the patient uh, throughout Europe. Yeah, that's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Uh, Patrice, I, I'd like to, to uh, maybe offer you to, to make a, um, a response or concluding statement uh, on, uh, uh, on this oh, last point. Yeah, no, no, it, yeah. it can be, I think, we are short in time. It, it will be, I don't know if it will be conclusive, but at least uh, to rebound regarding what Florence Butlin just uh, told us and told us during this, this discussion. I remember, and Florence probably remember as well, uh, our old discussion, not so old, but old discussion with Barbara von Sweeten, with Barbara von Sweeten. When we were discussing the, the, these points, she, she uh, used to tell us, OK, uh, come to an agreement in your academic or scientific field, get a consensus, and once we will have you will have got this consensus, come and see us. That was the global statement. And I think uh, uh, this is quite interesting because EBC finally is the right body to do it. E e EBC is the right body to be the go-between between the scientific, the academic field and the patient population. And once, once the, the academic field, the scientific field and the Patients' population are coming to an agreement to something very important, like, like an outcome measure we mentioned, a patient-based outcome measure, unlike the use of the tools Florence Button mentioned, the new tools, etc. Once we come to an agreement with that, it, it be, once again the EBC institution and could be the right body to convey the message and the global message to EMA. And I think it, it, it is what we have to do. Certainly, and we can come to an agreement. We, I am sure, both for the Parkinson field, uh, 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 as we discuss it, or the schizophrenia, and other next coming, of course, issue we will discuss within EBC. So that, that would be my my hope. Thank you, Patrice. Uh, Fabio, a last word from you. Well, my last words with, well, I mean, again, thank you uh, everyone for, for this uh, uh, very nice conversation and uh, for the availability of, uh, of Florence Butlin. Uh, last, my last words to the EMA are just this, let us work with you and for you, because at this point it's quite uh, clear that we might save you some time uh, to do a lot of, of things. We have the... the, the uh, uh, the experience, the expertise, uh, and so let us work for you and Thank with you. Thank you, Fabio. Uh, for Whenever us, you will decide, it's the time. From your side, um, last thing, reflecting on, on uh, things that were said and maybe the way ahead. Yeah, no, thank you for, for this and thank you for your interest in our activities. I mean, as I said, oh, we welcome very much, um, you know, um, yes, this discussion and uh, we value your institution. So. Obviously, we'd be happy to work more with you, whatever the form it can take. Well, uh, we have a framework in place to collaborate with healthcare professionals, with academia. So uh, EBC can be part of that or not. I mean, uh, you know, I, I explain a bit further what it is um, uh, uh, to be an eligible uh, uh, yes, uh, association for us, but can be another type of collaboration. I mean... Uh, we are open and uh, yeah, for the guideline, as I said, it's unfortunate, but we have been uh, obviously limited um, in terms of reopening uh, because of the business continuity plan. We are going from one to another for a few years now, but hopefully um, we we can resume this, those activities um, as soon as possible. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Florence. And I think uh, it's now time for me to, to close uh, uh, 
uh, the discussion of uh, of today and uh, and to thank our, our, our panelists of the day. Uh, we feel obviously that uh, much more could have been said, and uh, but we hope that at least we could have gone uh, the extra mile based on the the discussion we had at our at our first event in October. Uh, that our audience uh, actually feels that uh, we listen to to their contribution and manage to uh, bring it forward uh, to to Florence uh, for additional insight on uh, on the workings of EMA and the potential that uh, that lies there. So for more information, uh, we will post everything on the Brain Innovation Days website, of course, uh, on the braininnovationdays.eu. We have hosted a number of reports and publications. Um, we will also include all the work that uh, Florence alluded to uh, today. So uh, stay tuned on the website for, for this. So thank you again uh, for three speakers and uh, three panelists for uh, your time today, for this great discussion. We look forward to um, uh, the next uh, steps in, in this regard. And to our listeners, uh, thank you for um, uh, tuning in uh, to our Brain Talks and Overtime sessions. Um, for the last events and for uh, also the events to come. Uh, we will have more podcasts uh, to come in, particularly also with the winners of the pitching competition uh, that is going to uh, follow in the, in the coming days. So thank you uh, to everyone and goodbye. Stay tuned uh, to our BI Day website. Thank you. Mm -hmm.